Hi there folks, uh, back again for another video. In this one, we're going to be having a look at the rules that I'm going to be using alongside my sharp miniatures from War Games Atlantic. I teased this a little bit when we were looking at the unboxing of the miniatures uh, over the last week or so. Um, and this is Chosen Men, which is by Mark Latham and is from Osprey War Games and effectively fits into the Blue Book series that they do. So these are relatively cheap books. I think this one's RRP is $12.99, but I think I've seen this for as little as £8 online if you're tempted to pick it up. And it is a handy set of rules. Um, one of the main reasons that I wanted to pick this up um, is that Mark Latham has a fairly good history with Warhammer Historics, and in particular one of the games that I'm massively fond of called Legends of the Old West, which is a set of rules that um, was designed for the Middle Earth strategy battle game and ended up being used for a Wild West game at the same time and just works really well. The Middle Earth strategy battle game rules as a whole are just great, uh, and it was nice to see that fitting into that. But Mark has worked on some really good products for Games Workshop, and this, um, as I've seen in other reviews, kind of feels like a Games Workshop game in many regards, um, especially when it comes to a lot of the ways that the resolution of actions works and stuff. But it's a fairly tight volume coming in at just, as you can see there, 64 pages, and it goes at a bit of a clip and reads really well, which I think is one of the most important things about this. The other thing I th the other good thing about this game, um, and it's something that very much appealed to me, is that the scale of the game feels like a skirmish game. You can bring a fair amount of models to the tabletop, but at most, I think I'd be looking to maybe play with sort of, you know, 50 models tops perhaps just because i want to try and play out the kind of skirmishes that i've seen in the tv shows so sharp is a show where you have a couple of heroic individuals and then you have a variety of sort of iconic um, individuals that fight alongside them against a mass of effectively mooks in many regards um You'll see Sharp and his chosen men, for example, the British Riflemen, going up against loads of French people and like taking on the soldiers in sieges and back alley brawls and ambushes and all sorts of different things that you would get on campaign. And this book very much allows you to slot into that um, sort of uh, scale of warfare, I guess you'd say. Um, so, characteristics and stuff like that. Uh, models have a variety of them. So you've got melee, which is for melee. Uh, resistance, command, wounds, tactics, and strategy. So, TAC and STG strategy uh, are going to be quite important for this game, and they are the things that will sort of drive the way that you move your models around on the tabletop. Um, there are a couple of different unit types as well for you to go through. So, uh, everything's broken down into infantry, cavalry, artillery, and independent officers, as you would have guessed. And there's a distinct focus as you would have thought about for the napoleonic period on the idea of um officers being able to help units um and uh pushing them to do more and all that kind of stuff so uh buh, buh, buh. yeah so here we go one of the nice things about the game as well is it's got some really nice stuff in there to kind of build on flavour. So you've got some nice things here called the Cauldron of War, which we'll come back to later. But this is the meat and potatoes of the game. So this is the action phase, and this is where you get to do your stuff. So uh, ver units will have a tack value, and that tack value allows you to do a variety of different actions, as you can see here. So you can move for one, or you can move at the double for two, and that only applies to skirmishing infantry units. You can charge, you can dig in. In, you can disengage you can hold most people are going to be doing fire and move basically and occasionally charging if you're going to have our um, cavalry in your games and as you can see there's a little movement chart there of how it all works you just spend attack and that model or that unit is effectively activated and done something on the on the tabletop same for all the rest of these you spend their sort of tack value so if we go back to this stat line here you can see that the tack value of a rifleman so that would be your standard unit 
is four. So you've got four points with which to do stuff during this phase. So four points could be move twice or move at the double and then fire or it could be to dig in or something like that or use a different ability that's attached to the unit and stuff which i think is kind of cool uh there's changing your formations in there which is great if you're going to be switching between line and square which can be good and has benefits depending on what you're charging against uh you've got your different ways of forming it to think those are the different formations by the way so you've got line You've got a uh, column of attack and all that kind of stuff. Uh, what was the other thing? So you've got dig in, which is gives you bonuses to your defense and stuff like that. Uh, and then here is the one that everyone's going to know. So this is fire. So fire is an interesting one. So you choose what you're going to be firing at. And then one of the nice things about this is that it has an interesting range weapon chart. So uh, Range weapons are sort of set by their accuracy, as you can see there. So a musket has a 5 plus to hit, a uh, musketoon 5 plus, a rifle 4, uh, and then everything else is 5 plus there. And then there's a couple of special rules that are tied into each of them. But then you have different variants depending on what you've done to... Uh, to benefit yourself so if you've managed to get within a shorter range or something or if you've managed to get an aim shot off um, in addition to your fire action then you get some benefits there as well and then when you comes to doing damage and stuff like that you're going to be rolling to try and equal or beat the resistance resist resilience value sorry of the uh, in order to score a point of damage which I think is kind of cool so if we go back to that basic stat line of the uh, infantry and stuff up here so their resistance was a three so you know pretty easy to kill things in this game which is nasty uh, and then you'll remove characters and stuff like that uh, you also got command checks which is something that people will be familiar with if you're diving into uh something if you've come over from something like uh warhammer and stuff like that there's also the mellow phase so this is when things have maneuvered into combat this is where we get sort of a little bit of the kind of Warhammer, a little bit of the Middle Earth at the same time as well. So you select the comet to resolve and then you do pile in moves, which is something that I think a lot of people will be familiar with if you've played any of those kind of Warhammer games. And then you work things out in strike order and then carry through. So it feels um, more complicated than it is, but I think that's basically because there's a couple of diagrams and stuff in here that make you go huh how does that work but it's, it seems very self-explanatory once you get into playing it which is quite good so uh once again you've got mellow weapons and they give they have different damage profiles here as you can see and also some that give you various bonuses to hit uh you'll be rolling a d6 to hit against the uh against this chart here so you have a melee value, and then you have the defender's value, and you'll be rolling against that. So this is a matrix that a lot of people will be very familiar with, again, if you've played something like Warhammer. And then you do the additional damage, uh, trying to equal or beat the resilience value to do points to your opponent, which is very cool. <clears throat> and then you remove casualties, as per usual. Uh, this is one of the things that I think a lot of people will be... It, it looks confusing, but it's... It's not, it's very much a, this has been done so that you've got a little bit of a clear idea of how a, a massed combat would work. You effectively just have to try and pair things up well and have a think about who's going to attack who based on, it, 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 it seems very complicated when you look at something like that and you go, oh, I don't know, really know how this works. But once you read through this, it's just, it's very simple. It's you effectively just go through in strike order and you sort of work through the different um, units and see which ones work out best and all that kind of thing. So uh, it, it the, the basic melee seems very simple. And then once you layer on additional multiple combats and stuff like that, um, it doesn't get, it feels complicated, but it's not. I think that's the best way of putting it. There we go. Rather than gilding the lily on that. You have a recovery phase that so you try and rally your units and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then you can move fleet units and that kind of things if they don't manage to rally. Uh, but there are different ways for you to play around with that, um, depending on your officers and all that kind of thing as well. Uh, and then you have your scenery rules, as per usual. But this is where I like that it's a skirmish game, so you're not going to be moving massive blocks of infantry around. You're effectively just moving around smaller units that, well, 
to begin with, you're going to be running smaller units, and they're going to be sneaking around through passageways and, and all that kind of stuff, and battling through streets uh, in order to control different units and stuff. But uh, the benefit of leaders and stuff like that, so having NCOs and all that kind of thing, including the humble sergeant, maybe like Harper, for example, you've got some options there for how they work and obviously how your command value applies to your men, which seems very self-explanatory. You've got the different orders that can be given by your unit leaders and officers and stuff. So this is a really fun one. So you can have some additional bonus um, uh, tactics being used by your officers in order to make your regular troops better. And I think this is where a lot of the flavor of chosen men comes in because it, and again, feels like playing through sharp on the tabletop because uh, especially for me anyway, as somebody who's coming into this and wants to play a game that feels very similar, well, very simple and easy to dive into and have fun with, rather than it being like um, sort of bogging you down under a whole host of rules and sort of point-by-point uh, point differentials and all that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, so you dive in with your characters and they can give both TAC, once, if they spend both TAC and STG, they can give particular orders to make your units just that little bit better as well. Uh, this is another of the really nice things about chosen men, is that your independent officers, so those that are slightly higher ranking, can take a whole host of additional uh, strategies and stuff to use in your games. So strategies are kind of sort of big abilities almost that uh, kind of give you a one-up and play around with the, um, I guess you'd say like the daring do and the swashbuckling and stuff that you'd get in your sort of Napoleonic Wars. And I really like this because it sort of allows you to give a little bit of character to your leaders. You could either use these to represent a historical character if you wanted to, or if you're playing something as I am, where you're playing with Sharp and a lot of fic fictional characters, you can use these to create interesting characters for you to use in your games or obviously for you to go up against. You've also got additional um, traits that your commanders can have, which are the, again very much feel like they flow into this idea of making the kind of character that you want to make. Do you want to make this person impetuous, charging into the heart of battle without any thought to their own safety? Do you want to make them a cautious man who looks after his own men? Do you want to make them someone who throws his men off, um, you know, to go do all the fighting, but then sits at the back? watching over things and all that kind of stuff. There's some really nice traits in here to kind of add flavor to your models and build the characters that you want. Obviously, if you're going to be diving into playing uh, someone like Sharp, you might take something like Risen from the Ranks, which would be a good one to use. Or maybe Lucky could be a nice one for him because he's quite lucky. Lead from the Front would also be very fitting for Sharp as well, um, which I think is quite cool. Or Marksman too, which is quite nice. There's also a really nice way that um, uh, artillery is fired. So what you do with artillery is that you sort of pick a kind of point almost on the battlefield that you want to go for, and then you must choose at least one of the accuracy dice, but you can choose all three. And you're basically rolling to see... Um, uh, we'll see, here we go. Roll these dice. Uh, based, so you roll as many accurate dice as you can. And then you roll these dice and add that number to the cannon's range to establish where the shot hits. So this is where it lands. And then you roll 2d6 to see where it bounces effectively and smashes into other models. So it's a little bit like the kind of stuff that you would get in sort of classic Warhammer and things. But one of the interesting things about that is that you have misfires. So when you're rolling for your... Uh, accuracy dice and you score a one you must roll on the misfire table so it makes cannons incredibly deadly but also incredibly prone to blowing up and well not necessarily blowing up but um, doing damage to you at the same time unfortunately the thing that's really cool about this though as well is that it kind of has this really fun push your look element to it where it makes as i say cannons deadly but it doesn't make them the the 
the be all and end all. It doesn't make them a surefire win for you on the tabletop. I also like that you've got different ways of firing, so you can have like cannon shot, trap, and all that kind of thing as well. So you can play around with different styles of uh, cannon shot depending on where the enemy are. So, for example, there they've shot them with uh, canister shot or well, shrapnel probably, uh, to hit all those men as they close in on them, I think it's quite nice. You do have sort of, um, I think it shows it here, they have like a like a, a minimum range. Um, so that's like the distance at which you can fire, which I think is kind of cool. Um, and then there's different damage that they do depending on what they hit and what they graze as it flies past, which I think is quite nice. Uh, units can have specialists, so you can have drummers, you can have buglers, you can have chosen men, so you can turn them into uh, hagmen and the like uh, for use in your games. You've got ensigns. Um, there's also special rules that apply to all sorts of different uh, units, which then give them the flavour that they would have. Uh, so light infantry, obviously, is great for you know your chosen men, your riflemen. And there's loads of these as well. And then we come to the force list. Now, this isn't exhaustive, but I have seen that a lot of people have put together lists online for you to play as a variety of other factions that you might have heard of. But um, you essentially have uh, the French, the British, I think, and there's a, uh, a couple of additional ones in here. We'll, we'll come to them later anyway. So French. Uh, so you've got your special rules for being French. So you have your colonel d'attaché. So uh, the attaque, probably. So that's your column of attack. So the French infantry may form column of attack as a free action. And then you have the shadow of Bonaparte. The French may choose their cauldron of war strategy at the start of the game. Ah, yes, so it's cauldron of war. So this is something that happens at the beginning of the game and kind of gives you a sort of um, a hint to what's happening in the wider battlefield. So the idea with Chosen Men is that it takes place in a corner of a larger conflict. So... If this was Waterloo, maybe your game of Chosen Men would be based around Le Haison or something like that. Um, and this kind of plays into this. So obviously the French get to choose this, but normally you would roll to see what you get. So maybe you get grape shot, so someone gets shot by grape shot, or an artillery barkment comes in, or there's a cavalry threat somewhere, so you need to work out um, where, well, well, where, Depending on where you've set up, you might have some problems with morale and all that kind of thing. So there's some really interesting stuff there for those people who want to play around with the idea of this being um, a microcosm of something a lot larger. So then the French get their colonels, their lieutenant colonels, French spy, light infantry, regular infantry, and foot dragoons. Uh, they also have their marines de la garde, the young guard tricolour, the car carabiner à cheval, my French pronunciation is awful. The Hussars, the Lancers, and the Chasseur à Cheval. So you've got plenty of options here that would be fitting for the period um, and playing around with Napoleonics. You've also got a cannon, of course. You've got, then got the Peninsula Allies. So these would have been those fighting alongside the French while they were in the Peninsula. So fighting during that sort of first portion of, um, well, actually probably pretty much all of um, Sharp's time uh, during the TV series. So you've got uh, Germans, the Nassau Light Infantry there, some Swiss mercenaries, the Polish Lancers, and the it Italian Artillery. And there's some additional uh, special rules there for the remnants of Conquest. Then you have your Great British Troops. So this is where you're going to be going if you're going to be making Sharp and his lads. So you've got the Colonel or the Lieutenant Colonel, the Major, so you could do Major Sharp. You've got your British spy. You've got your light infantry, your rifles. So you can only have one to three of the uh, zero to three of those, uh, but they allow you to effectively make the chosen men. So they only get five in the squad as base, but you can add an additional five on. You can have a bugler. You can have a captain. So you could do Captain Sharp if you wanted to put a smaller uh, unit and then have one of the other officers leading the way, perhaps. Uh, and then you can include, for every five men in the unit, you can upgrade them to chosen men. So uh, for in the case of a sort of larger 10-man unit, that would give you two chosen men alongside Harper, so you could have Cooper and Hagman, and then you could have Harper leading the way. And then if you wanted a captain, you could have that Captain Sharp, or you could make Sharp into a major and have him just attached to the unit if you so desired. And then you have your regular light, uh, line infantry as well. So yeah, nice stuff there for the Great British. Oh, and there's also this special rule, which again slots nicely into uh, 
the idea of Sharp fighting on the tabletop, so three shots a minute. Any infantry unit from the Great British Force performing a fire action with muskets may spend one extra attack when shooting. If they do so, they gain D3 extra shots for every full, every full five models in the unit. So if you're going to be running the South Essex, that's a good rule to have alongside them. You've then got your Royal Marines. Uh, landing party, so if you wanted to go a little bit of Hornblower, you could. You, you like Dragoons, your Hussars, and your Cannons, and then a Royal Marines Gunnery Team. There's also the British Peninsula Allies, so they can call on the likes of the Spanish with their Colonels and their Cacadores, uh, alongside a whole bunch of Span uh, Portuguese militia, Spanish guerrillas, and more there as well. So if you're playing... Uh, in the early seasons of Sharp with his lovely lady. Then you could throw these into the mix, which would be quite nice. And then we go towards Waterloo. So this is where we're seeing some additional bits and pieces in here. So this is allowing you to tinker a little bit more with that and play around in that particular battle and that sort of era of Napoleonic warfare. So a whole bunch of additional models in there for making some of the, uh, well, profiles, four models. For making some of the additional characters that you might run into. And then you have the Prussians. Everybody loves the Prussians. I know a lot of people wanted the Russians and stuff. But I think they've been done as kind of like a separate. Um, sort of fan made supplement I believe. And there's a few other bits and pieces that have been added in here. But because things are quite simple when it comes to the stat lines and stuff. I don't think it would be too hard to make a specific unit. Should you so desire. You then have uh, a neat. Uh sort of set of scenarios now it says to play out your regular games of uh starting out with between 150 and 350 points and so this is something that i wanted to raise actually because i think it'd be really fun to hear what people have to say so i put together a quick 150 point force and it was five rifles alongside a major which gets me to 120 as you can see there and then after throwing in a few extra bits and pieces and giving some skills to major sharp effectively my little tiny starter force was just five riflemen and major sharp going up against the enemy which thought would be quite interesting by comparison on the french side of things i think i went with a i think it was lieutenant colonel and a band of the light infantry and i built up i think it was 10 or so of the light infantry alongside the lieutenant colonel so it would be a proper little scrap skirmishing scrap between um a bunch of effectively mooks really going up against the rifleman there to see who would come out on top but um as you can see uh, as you start to go further on, you'll probably want to get up to around 350 points, but you can go even higher between 350 and 500 for your kind of standard games. And you can play it even larger if you like, because the rules flow quite nicely and easily, so it's not too hard to get your head around it. Um, they, but there's a lot of common sense when it comes to the scenarios and stuff. Uh, and there's some fun bits and pieces in here in terms of how you claim victories and things. But there are also a set of different scenarios, which again, are very sort of... Um, part and parcel of any war game it's the kind of stuff that you'd expect them to have so you've got like a classic fight a hot uh, take and hold a particular map uh, portion of the map uh, an attack from both sides a vanguard attack um uh and then some fun ones at the end there as you can see it's like bonaparte's gold and uh capturing the flag um so yeah it's it's a fun little book that i think is uh really going to get me stuck into a little bit of napoleonic warfare on the tabletop and that's the main thing I don't need this to be massively historically accurate. Obviously, it's been well-researched and put together in such a way that it's fun for people to dive into playing Napoleonic Wars on the tabletop. But it feels like a great entry-level product, and I think that's the main thing with this. It's not one that um, feels like it's going to overwhelm you. And that's one of the things that I think a lot of people say about Napoleonic stuff uh, in general is that you can step into it and it just suddenly feels like a massively overwhelming um, part of the hobby, the wargaming hobby as a whole, where you're not quite sure if you've got the right regiments or if they're in the right period and all that kind of thing. And um, but I think I think coming out from the view, the viewpoint of almost being a little bit Hollywood and playing around with the idea of Sharp and his chosen men and playing those stories out, or maybe Hornblower's stories. Um, I think is a really good way of approaching things and getting stuck in. It's certainly what's inspired me, and I think that's one of the most important things. And it, I think it's teaching people that historical war games don't have to be scary. Um, 
which is something that I know a lot of war games aren't, but they feel that sometimes to people. I think it's one of the great strengths of Bolt Action is that it feels like a war game that someone could watch, say, from Private Ryan, or they could watch, I don't know, Band of Brothers, and they could step out of that into playing Bolt Action, and it feels like the things that they've seen on TV. And from there, it's simply a jumping-off point to dive deeper and deeper into the series. So, well, the period. (laughs) Uh, Or the series, I guess. Uh, But yeah, I uh, really like this, and I can't wait to actually give it a go properly and dive into a little bit more of it. I've tinkered around with a little bit of dice rolling here and there, and it seems like a fun little set of mechanics, just some sort of plotting things out. Uh, I just basically need to get my uh, head out of my ass and maybe build some tables and paint some men. I've got some French infantry coming soon as well, so that'll be really fun to dive into and paint them up. I'll uh, tell you all about them probably in a future hobby chat. But yeah, Chosen Men from Osprey War Games by Mark Latham. Really fun and a great introduction to the Napoleonic period on the tabletop. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. Uh, I'm going to move on and get ready for another video. And uh, yeah, bye.